Hello there, this is David Williams with Jesus Ministries, and we're going to talk today about a very, very important topic that's very relevant to all of us, and that's survival. All of us have a very, very strong, and some stronger than others, survival instinct. And many times that survival instinct can lead us to doing things that can take us right away from our created purpose. And whether you realize it or not, we are created. We're created by God, and he designs us for specific reasons, and he's working to make sure that we, we obtain, that we achieve and arrive at the reasons for which we've been created. So we're going to start off in the book of Hosea today as we, dis as we discuss this, because as things get harder economically all over the world, as things get harder financially all over the world, we're going to need to know what our proper posture should be. What's the right posture? How should we act just because things are, are beginning to, to change? Well, if you don't have a Bible, I'll have the scriptures up here for you so that you can follow along with, with today's teaching. But in the book of Hosea, we're going to, to look at chapter 2, and we're talking about trusting God, overcoming financial worry. Trusting God, overcoming financial worry. Now, let's start off in verse 5 in Hosea 2. It reads, for their mother, this is God speaking through the prophet Hosea, to the nations of Israel and Judah, and says, for their mother, describing the nation, has played the harlot. A harlot is a prostitute. She is conceived, she that conceived them has done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, those that she was committing adultery with, that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, which is a material used to make candles and other things, my oil and my drink. So now you've got this illustration that God is working in the prophet Hosea, where God has the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute and have children from her. And then she eventually, or during their relationship, she's, she's cheating on him. She's having affairs. And he's using this in this man's life as an illustration of what the nations of Israel and Judah are doing to him. And so Hosea represents God in this sense. And Hosea's wife and her children represent the nation and the nation of Israel. The first thing that, that I'd like to point out is that our desire for material things, whether they're luxuries or whether they're necessities, a luxury would be considered a car. I know that you might think that having a car is a necessity. In actuality, there are many people all over the world that don't own them. So you can live without a car. You can't live without food and drink. You can't live without clothing for too long, depending on the environment that you're in, depending on the environment that you're in. So our desire for material things, whether they're luxuries or necessities, render us vulnerable to temptation. So we've got to be very careful about that, about our desires. If you look at the, the fifth verse in chapter 2, he says she's played the harlot, meaning she's behaved like a prostitute, an adulterous woman, because it says, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread, my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. So here she's saying, I'm going to go after those that give me this material. In verses 7 and 8, Hosea 2, 7 and 8, it says, and she will follow after her lovers, but she will not overtake them or she won't meet up with them. And she will seek them, but will not find them. Then... Will she say, I will go and return to my first husband, that's describing the Lord, for then it for then was it better with me than now, for she did not know that I, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet, that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. So he's saying that he was her provider. God was her provider the whole time, but she didn't respect that. And so she gave what God gave to her. She gave it to others. She spent it on others and she began to follow others. Uh, 
Pursuing material satisfaction will always prove elusive or hard to obtain. If you look at the seventh verse, it says she will follow after her lovers, but she won't overtake them. You'll, you're never satisfied with the material things that you do have. You always believe that you need more. It's very, and I'm not speaking for, for every single person, but naturally the, the scriptures tell us that the eye is not satisfied with seeing. The, the, our stomachs are, are practically never really satisfied. And so we've got to be aware of that so as to avoid be, being classified as a prostitute in the eyes of our God. So in verse 7, it says, she will follow after her lovers, but she won't overtake them, meaning she'll always be trying to obtain them. She'll always be trying to obtain material satisfaction from these lovers but she won't be able to achieve it. The third point, failure is intended as motivation to reestablish our faithfulness to Jesus Christ. So when God allows us to fail in our pursuing materialism, it's because he wants us to redirect our focus on him. Misidentifying the source of our provision will cause us to misdirect honor and allegiance. What does that mean? Look at verse 8 there. For she did not know that I gave her her corn, wine, oil, and multiplied her silver, which they prepared for Baal. So when God gives you time, when God gives you energy, when God gives you money, when God gives you a place to live, he gives you a family, do you honor him with the things that he's given you? Or do you believe it was your hard work, good looks, and intellect that achieved these things for you? Because if you believe that you did this without God, then you're not going to honor God. You're not going to obey God. You're going to do whatever it takes to maintain this, this high status in the eyes of the people. Because in your eyes, doing what you did by your own strength is what won you favor with these people. And so many people forsake God and spend more time at work, more time at the laundromat, if you don't have washer and dryer at your home, more time taking care of your material possessions, your car, your house, more time doing things that don't have anything to do with God's will for humanity. They have nothing to do with God's will. They're minimal. They're peripheral, but we're focusing on certain things. And so when we pursue these material things, we're never going to be satisfied. Failure is supposed to motivate us. Look at what it says in verse 7 at the end of it. I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. So when God allows us to fail, it's supposed to motivate us to return to him so he can restore us. When we don't respect, that it's God who provides for us, we will become adulterous, idolatrous, we will turn away from God and start focusing on the source, like for instance, again, our jobs. If you don't understand that it's God that provides for you, then you think it's your boss, it's your company that provides for you. And so if they want you to work all kinds of hours, regardless of how that affects you and your walk with the Lord, or regardless of how that affects God's purpose for your life, you'll do it. That's not God's will. So what is God's will concerning this? What, what does Jesus Christ say concerning his will for our lives? Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, a familiar passage. I'd like to examine Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 21. It's written in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There is so much that we can pull out of that statement, that, that eternal truth that Jesus Christ is giving to us. Look at verse 5. Or I'm sorry, verse 21, point number 5. Verse 21, point number 5. The heart is symbolic of the person's true self. The heart is the very seat of our identity. It is where my identity rests. So my heart symbolizes my true self. Life is in the blood. We know that the heart is at the very center of my body's circulatory system. That's the part that circulates the blood throughout my body. What we've got to understand is that our hearts are symbolic of our very lives. 
And we know that because Leviticus tells us the life of the body is in the blood. The life of the body is in my blood. And there's so many things to say about that. But what we value has control of our hearts. So whatever I'm emotionally or mentally attached to, if I'm emotionally and mentally attached to my own survival, the survival of my family, above the will of God, above whatever else that God wants me to do, if I'm afraid for my life, if I'm worried about tomorrow financially, if the devil can manipulate me, then he can get me to commit adultery against the Lord. He can get me to obey him in order to make sure that I have, I have something to eat. Our hearts steer our decisions, and our decisions determine our reality forever. My heart guides my decisions, my thoughts and my emotions. So I've got to make sure that my thoughts and my emotions are with the Lord. He says, where my treasures are, that's where my heart is. So if my treasures, if your treasures are in money, or if your treasures are in material sustenance, healthcare, and those types of things, you'll do anything. Because if, if that's what you value, your heart is there, and you'll reject the will of God just to accommodate your heart, to fulfill your heart. So our hearts steer our decisions and our decisions determine our reality. If my decisions are pleasing to God, then my reality will be God's kingdom, not just in this realm, but in the realm to come. But if my decisions displease the Lord, then my reality will be the lake of fire. It will be eternal damnation forever. God doesn't want that for us, so he wants our hearts to be steered by his will. Jumping down to Matthew 6, verse 30. Jesus says, wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, meaning he gives it its green color, which today is, and he decorates it with flowers, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, which is how they would get rid of grass, at least in certain ways, that's how this farming culture of Israel would get rid of their grass. You chop it down and you burn it, and, and to, tomorrow is cast into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith. If God decorates the grass with flowers, he's saying how much more will he provide for you that beauty, O you of little faith. The Lord desires to prove his ability to provide for us. That is why he says, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, how much more can he clothe you? The Lord Jesus is revealing that the Father in heaven wants to prove how much he loves us by providing for us. And so worry needs to go out of the window in all of our lives. Uh, number nine, God uses nature to prove his faithfulness to mankind. And so we should pay attention to nature to see what God is promising to do in our lives. Believers can generate, we can strengthen, we can develop faith in Jesus Christ by remembering the wonders of creation. And so we've got to ask ourselves, am I worth more than grass? Am I worth more than a sparrow? Well, there's certain people in our society that would say no, that we're animals and that we're not worth any more than those things. That is not what the word of God says. And so believers are supposed to be able to look at the nature around us that is going to all pass away. It's all going to be destroyed one day. And he wants us to understand God's power powerful love for us. So are you worth more than grass? When anxiety concerning your financial well-being, concerning the care of your family, concerning your health, when the when things start getting worse and the enemy starts tempting you to 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 do whatever it takes to survive, even if that means rebel against God. We've got to ask ourselves, are we worth more than grass? And if the answer to that is yes, then we've got to have the, the faith that God is going to provide for us since we know he readily provides for nature, he clothes nature in beauty. Lack of faith in God causes low self-worth. Jesus calls these people that he's speaking to 
of little faith because he's saying they don't believe God will provide for them even though God provides for the grass. So not believing that God will provide for me even though he provides for the grass must bring to the real must bring to reality the fact that I don't think I'm worth more than the nature around me. I don't think I'm worth more than grass. Point 12, if God manages something as temporary as grass, how much more does he watch over you and I? 13, doubting God will provide for us is disbelief in his character, which is goodness and love. So if I don't believe that God will actually provide for me, I'm questioning whether he's good or not. I'm doubting the fact that he's even good. Questioning what God values, like Humanity, God values humanity. We know that because he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. Questioning what God values is questioning God's heart. Remember why? Because God's treasure is where his heart is. So if God's heart is with you, his treasure is with you. If God's love is for you, his provision is for you. So when we doubt whether God will provide for us, we're doubting his goodness and love. And when we question God's values, we're questioning his heart. When, we, when we're questioning I don't whether God will actually take care of us as children of God, as those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who are called, who are the called according to his purpose. Questioning what God values is questioning his heart, forgetting the fact that wherever God's heart is, that's where his treasure is, because where his treasure is, that's where his heart is. Matthew 6, 31 through 32. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal will we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Those in unbelief, the unbelievers, the ungodly, they prioritize material provision because they are not aware of God nor his heart. With a survival of the fittest mentality, they believe that they must fend for themselves. All of us naturally have that survival of the fittest mentality, believing that we've got to make things work. And so we'll rebel against God, even though God is promising to provide for us. Those who know God as their heavenly father should also know that it is his desire to protect and to prosper them. Look at what it says in verse 32. He says, for your heavenly father knows you have need of these things. If you know God as your heavenly father, then you should respect his love for you. You should respect the fact that he wants to provide for you. You should believe the fact that it's him who's going to make sure that you're going to have everything that you need. And so God wants us to understand that since he's our heavenly father, it is his desire to protect us. It is his desire to prosper us. It is his desire to make sure that we have what we need. The unbeliever doesn't believe God as their heavenly father. And so if he's not my heavenly father, of course I need to fend for myself. But if he, I am a believer, if I've been born again, I've been baptized into the blood of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, his death and resurrection, I must believe that he's going to protect me and prosper me as long as I'm focused on him because he loves me. And the last two points I'd like to bring out are, are verse 33 in Matthew 6. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Through salvation, Jesus frees mankind from self-preservation, which is rooted in unbelief, so that man can focus on representing and establishing God's kingdom will on earth. That was God's purpose from the beginning. And lastly, God's treasure is with those who prioritize the matters of his heart. What are, what, what's on God's heart? God wants you to be his child and he wants to be your God. That's a statement spoken throughout the entire Bible that I would be their God and they would be my people. And so he wants us to live like him and by his Holy Spirit and power and power others to live like him. Reading the, the, the record of Jesus Christ, the history of Jesus Christ, reading how God treats the, the man of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, seeing 
the 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 varieties of his uh, seeing how how wide the range of his love and and mercy is displayed in their lives well it's supposed to encourage us and motivate us to be faithful to him and not to be afraid of the economic hardships not to be afraid of not having money to buy, to buy groceries i know it's such a natural desire that we all have but god wants to prosper us and deliver us from that fear we can't serve that fear and walk by faith in Jesus Christ. It's going to bring about an adultery that God's going to identify and indict us for. And so brothers and sisters that are watching this, I encourage you to continue to spend time in the presence of God so God can deliver you from the power of fear, the power of anxiety, the power. The word of God says that at some point people's hearts are going to fail them because of the fearful things that, were, that are going to be happening in the days to come. There are many, many reasons to, to, to be afraid and to doubt God, but God wants to wipe those reasons out of our minds. He wants us to be totally at peace with him because why we seek first we prioritize him we prioritize his will for our lives we prioritize his will for the lives of those around us and that's why we're working we're working toward that he's delivered us and empowered us in the holy spirit if we've been filled with the spirit of god and he's directing us to meet the needs of others with his strength and with his grace and if you walk in that then you're going to see the provision of god in your life this is David Williams with Jesus Ministries. If you're ever in the West Palm Beach, South Florida area, please, you're welcome to come and join us. We're at 1750 Osceola Drive in West Palm Beach, Florida, 33409. We meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 p.m. and Sunday morning at 9 p.m. And if you'd like to call in for our prayer line, you, you're more than welcome. We encourage you to do that. Our number here, we're here 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Monday through Friday, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can call us at 561-469-2439. If you'd like to give to the ministry here and, be, and if you'd like to be a blessing to us, as we're serving you in the gospel, you can give through Facebook or YouTube. You can select the PayPal link below the video or in the About section of the profile page on Facebook. Through YouTube, you can select the PayPal link on our channel page banner or select the link below the video in the Information section. Or you can send through U.S. mail, check, or money order to Jesus Ministries, P.O. Box 17143, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33415. God bless all of you who love our Lord Jesus Christ, and we hope to see you again.